Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Louis DePaulo. I am the medical director of the Health Center at Hudson Yards. And today, it's my great privilege uh, to introduce um, Dr. Emma Gutman. Dr. Emma Gutman Yassi is an MD, PhD, and she is the Waldman Professor and System Chair of Dermatology and Immunology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. She is Director of the Center of Excellence in Eczema and the Occupational Dermatitis Clinic and Director of the Laboratory for Inflammatory Skin Diseases. She earned her MD from uh, Sackler University School of Medicine and her PhD from Balian University in Israel. After obtaining her Israeli board certification in dermatology, uh, she went on to um, continue uh, her work in the United States and pursue a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Rockefeller University in the Laboratory for Investigative Dermatology. Upon completion of her fellowship, she became board certified by the American Board of Dermatology. Dr. New York, Dr. Gutman's uh, major clinical research focus is on atopic dermatitis, eczema, and alopecia areola. Her research made paradigm shifting discoveries on the immunologic basis of atopic dermatitis in adults and in children, enriching the understanding of the pathophysiology of this common disorder, opening the door and accelerating testing of novel immune pathway specific targeted therapies for atopic dermatitis. Recently, Dr. Gutman also extended her research interest into hair loss disorders, such as alopecia areata and scarring hair loss disorders, chronic hand eczema, keloids, ichthyosis, and other skin diseases. Dr. Gutman is considered one of the world's leading experts in inflammatory skin disease. Her achievements have been repeatedly highlighted by the media, including the New York Times, ABC, CBS News, Daily News, Reuters, Wall Street Journal, New York, and others. I can go on, but uh, I think your CV speaks for itself. Um, and I'd like to begin um, with the fact that the unfortunate events around Jada Pinkett Smith uh, really highlighted um, really the emotional suffering of both families and patients, uh, the lack of public awareness, and the need for an informed conversation around the subject of alopecia in all of its various forms and presentations. So Dr. Gutman, may I first begin with the question, what is alopecia? Sure. So uh, there are several uh, flavors of alopecia or several types of alopecia. Uh, the one that Jada has is alopecia areata, it, and that's an autoimmune condition that basically um, uh, there is an attack uh, of uh, immune molecules on the hair follicles, uh, causing a, a, at the end a lack of hair. It starts usually with patchy hair loss, and then it spreads to be many times a total a scalp or total body hair loss. Um, and there are other types of alopecias um, that we see more in a, either a middle-aged women or, or men, but more in a female a patients, a scarring alopecias called frontal fibrosing alopecia or a lichen planus pilaris. And there is also a form that is quite common in, in, in particularly in African-American women. Uh, they can also be young in which they start losing hair in the uh, top of the scalp or the frontal scalp. And that's also causing a lot of distress to patients as well. And we are uh, going to take care of uh, uh, these patients as well because now we have some major discoveries in that type of alopecia as well. Thank you so much. You alluded to uh, you know, the emotional stress, and we certainly saw that in a very public forum. Um, can you give us some insights to you know, you know, little girls and, and women uh, and men, I assume, who are faced with this, what kind of um, stress they experience both for themselves, maybe socially, uh, and what the impact can be? Sure, so um, alopecia areata can affect all ages and all races and um, um, both men and uh, women and in children, even very young children, we see even babies with uh, alopecia areata. It causes a lot of uh, distress to the patient and to the family. Uh, I've seen um, uh, really terrible cases um, um, and the reason being is that we currently do not have anything approved for patients with alopecia. Yeah, I know it sounds terrible, but that's the case. 
we really don't have anything approved to give patients and particularly devastating, I think, are the cases in which there is significant hair loss. When we are talking about major parts of the skull and the body being lost, you know, hair is in a way your identity. And particularly when you also lose a eyebrows and eyelashes, you look in the mirror and you see somebody different. And, and you can imagine for kids, they are being bullied in school, not invited to parties. And, and also I have many patients that in, in the workplace, they start looking differently at them. And many times they think they have cancer, right? Because you are bald, you lose hair, you probably are treated with chemotherapy. Um, I have a patient that uh, is a lawyer, was coming in front of a judge. The judge was asking him, oh, how is your chemotherapy going? You know, things of this uh, sort on a daily basis. So aside from the obvious uh, presentation you talked about, the hair loss, um, how do you diagnose these different types of alopecia? Uh, we sometimes hear stress causes hair loss. Um, how, do you, how do you differentiate? How do you approach a, diagnos a diagnosis? Sure. Um, so many times we do need to do a biopsy and you do need to go to a dermatologist because it is important to know what type of alopecia you have so that we'll be able to treat you the right way because treatments may be different. And sometimes there is even a little bit confusion because, for example, maybe a, 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 a guy, a, a young guy, let's say, starts to have male pattern hair loss, but then on top of that male pattern hair loss, he also has alopecia areata and uh, maybe that we can treat. Uh, and we have examples of patients that in clinical trials, they grow their hair in full in areas that they could grow in full, but uh, you know, in frontal scalp, they still have that male pattern baldness. However, most of their hair is already back. So important to go to a dermatologist and many times uh, we do need a biopsy just to make sure that we know what type of alopecia it is. And one, one thing that we also need to talk about is the fact that now in this COVID era, we see many cases of hair loss, some due to stress, but now we start understanding that maybe a, having COVID a, a maybe shifts a little bit the immune phenotype of the body. And we see many, many more cases of alopecia areata primarily, a, either after COVID and sometimes even after a vaccine. Thank you for that. So, you know, for the men in the audience uh, who, like me, suffer from male pattern baldness, we've we've heard about pills, we've used pills, we've used creams, uh, a lot of products on the market. Uh, some people have gotten injections and transplant, uh, transplants. So what right now is the current state for treatment for not male pattern baldness, but for alopecia? Are any of these drugs, you know, applicable? Uh, and what's there for our patients right now? Yeah, it's a great question. And I wish I had great news for male pattern baldness, but to be truthful, I think the big discoveries now and the big advances are primarily for alopecia areata. That's the one that um, Jada Pinkett uh, Smith has. And also for uh, patients with scarring alopecia, there are also big advances there too. Uh, for male pattern baldness, I think we still are a little bit behind. Uh, there are uh, uh, things that we can do uh, with variable success rates like a, a PRP, platelet a rich plasma. Uh, and of course, we, we can do uh, hair transplantation. And there are some pills that uh, are available as well that were um, introduced as uh, pills for um, blood pressure. And then they were adapted for hair loss, uh, again, with variable uh, efficacy. But we don't yet have something that is super impressive for a male pattern baldness. Unlike alopecia areata in which we can take patients um, with total scalp loss all over the body and bring their hair back, which is gratifying. Is there a way to prevent the diagnosis? Uh, if there's early loss, is there something a patient can do before they go to medicines to prevent further loss? Uh, that's an excellent question. So for male pattern baldness, we see, for example, that uh, we have patients that come early in the 20s, uh, and these are patients that their parents already or their father lost hair already in the 30s and 40s. And we see that when they start early with a pill, um, uh, then uh, they do prevent that uh, hair loss. So I, I do tell patients, come early to your doctor and maybe start early on medications because when you already have major hair loss, then medications will not do much and you'll need a hair transplant, likely. Uh, 
patient and for patients with alopecia, can they get in the way of their progressive hair loss, or will they are they sort of destined to meet therapies? Uh, is there anything lifestyle changes they can do to help their hair loss? You are talking about alopecia areata? Alopecia, or the... All of the alopecia spectrum. Yeah, so uh, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> in alopecia uh, in general, treating early, I think, is the name of the game. Uh, in alopecia areata, we now have some studies showing that uh, when you treat in the first few years from when you have alopecia areata, and primarily the first 10 years, your results will be much better than if you waited 20 years to seek help. And if you treat in the first seven years, it's even better. Now we, we talk about the seven years since the last hairy growth. Another important thing is, if you see that your hair is shedding, but then it's coming back with different treatments, that's a very good sign. It means you have active disease and that's what we can actually uh, treat with immune-based treatments. Uh, the same, by the way, with some scarring alopecias. Uh, we don't want to have a, a untreated disease for many, many years because then we may uh, reach a, a kind of a dead end disease. And that's why it's so important to get help early in the game. Thank you very much for that. Um, obviously, we've, we've talked about the impact on families and family dynamic when someone suffers from alopecia. What about... Um, siblings of someone who has alopecia, uh, what it, are there genetic factors? How concerned should they be if there's a sibling uh, who does have, um, have hair loss? That's an excellent question. So first of all, alopecia does run in the family, but it's not only alopecia. We now know that it runs in families of patients with eczema and allergies. So for example, and this was previously unappreciated until recently, but now we know that patients with eczema, asthma, hay fever, um, you know, hives, they will tend to have more alopecia and also patients that have some uh, thyroid issues, they also will have more alopecia. So definitely, uh, first of all, when we have a patient with alopecia, we usually check for the others. Um, we, we do some thyroid functions, again, coming to the point that they need to um, go to a doctor and, and seek some help. And um, let's say if you're um, somebody in the family has alopecia, you cannot do anything preventatively, but the moment you actually start having any symptom, you should go seek help because again, treatment should be early in the game. Thank you. So as a pulmonologist, you began to sing my song when you mentioned asthma, allergy. We've, we've come to learn that uh, atopic uh, asthma, atopic eczema go together. Um, you know, there's theories that part of the reason, at least in asthma, it's it's an, it's a disease of civilized, it's of you know, of, of civilized societies, uh, you know, societies that are industrialized, um, and that we moved away from the farm, and our kids are no longer rolling in the dirt, so they're no longer getting exposed to antigens early in life, and we're beginning to think that's part of the reason why asthma is so prevalent um, in. Um, industrialized society. Is that true in skin diseases as well? Uh, you know, in atopic dermatitis, interestingly enough, the same theory uh, holds true. Um, and probably it's, uh, it has some truth because, for example, Asia, right, Japan is such a clean country, they are number one in, in eczema. So probably there is some truth to it. Um, but eczema and alopecia go together to some extent. They will not be a, similar to asthma and eczema, actually, not a, have the same severity at the same time. For example, right, if you have a patient with severe asthma, usually the patient will have mild AD and the opposite. But, but there is a tendency to run in the family. Thank you very much for that. Um, so you've alluded to the treatment options uh, in terms of biologics and targeted therapy. Um, None of them, as I understand, are FDA approved yet, so they're being used off-label. Yeah, okay. off-label um, or in clinical trials. So right. if you have eczema, you are lucky in a way because we can prescribe a biologics for alopecia, a Dupixent. And by the way, at Sinai, we will have a study for patients without eczema, actually, so they, they can enjoy uh, this biologic uh, uh, if they have a... Um, a atopy in the family or high IgE, which we, we will check because we found that patients with high IgE or 
uh, some uh, atopy in the family uh, will respond better. So we will have a study for both adults and children that will uh, have uh, that are prone to to atopy. And there are studies also with JAK inhibitors. Um, different JAK inhibitors are also now going into alopecia and uh, additional targets, uh, the target PD-1 and others. Um, I think the good news uh, for patients is that now both physicians and pharma really uh, partner together to find a solution uh, for this um, disease. And that's why we also formed the Sinai this um, center. Uh, because we want to really full steam ahead and uh, provide research that will identify new targets. And uh, uh, we want to follow these with clinical trials uh, directed to those new targets. Thank you so much for that. So if there's someone interested in the audience that you know is hearing this, there's obviously a degree of desperation in some of these patients because of all the things you've alluded to. Um, but then you hear not FDA approved or clinical trial what are the risks of these treatments? Or are there risks and what are they? And, and if there are risks, what, what are they? Yeah, you made a very good point. Just yesterday, I saw a patient in the clinic and I have to bring her story. So she went to an institute. I'd never heard, not a medical institute. It's a, some beauticians or I, I do not know what type of institute it is that has hair in the name. And um, she has scarring alopecia that started in the frontal scalp. And then they started to put um, different adhesives and artificial hair, uh, supposedly to help her grow her hair. And that actually in a very short time got her to lose her hair. So because the people are so desperate, there are many people taking advantage, uh, unfortunately, and not providing really a benefit but uh, even causing damage. And unfortunately, I hear that on a daily basis. So I think the most important thing is to stick with physicians that are known for this disease and uh, either physician scientists that uh, like me or people that really you can trust uh, that made a name for themselves in this disease. And uh, I think uh, in terms of benefits uh, and benefit and risk ratio, I think we always need to consider for any disease we treat, but definitely in alopecia, when we deal also with many young patients, very young, even 12 and up and even lower than that, we definitely need to consider safety. That's very important uh, to me. So for example, this is the reason why in my practice, I would not give off-label um, tofacitinib. That's gelzans, that's a panjak. I know that many people out there are giving uh, this to alopecia, but we need to remember Gelsians was not approved for psoriasis because of the safety profile. So why on earth would I put a patient with alopecia, sometimes a child on Gelsians uh, off-label, because the moment they stop the drug, they will lose all their hair. So they are doomed to use a drug that may not be as safe uh, for many, many years. And I don't think that's what we need. We need to really try to target in as specific as we can. And that's what we are trying to do, either off-label when it's possible or in clinical trials that are unique to us or, or to not many centers. Yeah, thank you for that. You know I chair the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, uh, and I thank you for your fine work for people in the audience. Um, the work of the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee is to make sure that drugs are safe, have a safe profile. Uh, and Dr. Government, your research is really moving the drugs are to on-label use with, that is data-driven by your clinical trials. So that way they can wind their way on formularies and patients can be confident when they take a drug that it's, it's really past the seal of approval. So again, thank you for your contribution to all of that. Um, so how best can family members support the affected patient? I mean, what can a family member do uh, either in terms of lifestyle or obviously emotional support? What can they do um, in terms of helping patients, their family members? Yeah, so I think uh, the support should be of two types. One um, is to help them seek help because I think uh, uh, the message to patients is in a way a good message. We now have ability to treat it. We have the ability to take patients with no hair or minimal hair and regrow full hair, either full or some to some extent. So we can change the natural course of the disease with effective treatment. So I think one is to find 
a physicians that can help that patient and centers like us that can help. That's one way to help. Then the other uh, one is there are associations like the National Alopecia Areata Foundation that have actually patient support groups that I think are very um, good, both for, for kids. You know, sometimes the kids um, need some resources that the family cannot provide. Kids, adolescents, and young adults, they feel really ostracized um, um, and not fitting. And I think it's important that they meet patients like them. Uh, it's very helpful. And also, uh, I found that these support groups are also very good for parents to these children because I've seen some parents really a, a too much a wanting their child to be on any treatment to the point that they don't even care about the safety. They just want the child to grow hair. And, you know, I don't think this is the right approach. I mean, I think you need to wait for the right drug for, for the patient. You cannot take safety risks and just, you know, to grow hair. And... Uh... I'm going to answer my own question in a minute, but let me ask you about what about normalizing the hair loss and saying, you know, uh, allowing a young child to not take therapy at all and say, you know, you're beautiful without your hair. Is that, you know, it, because you're right, there is stress on the on the on the child sometimes to be normal. That yeah. word comes with ramifications. Is, is that part of this at some point? Or? Absolutely. I, I think that's a big part of it. I think it's, first of all, to tell the child, listen, the way you are, you are a beautiful, a, a will accept you, everybody will accept you. And I'll tell you, a, a, when I was a resident at Cornell, you know, you, you alluded that I, I trained in two countries. So I did the training in Israel in dermatology and I retrained in the United States at um, a Cornell MSKCC. And actually one of my co-residents um, had alopecia universalis. And actually she also does a hair, she works on hair now in California. And you know, she had a very beautiful life. She was married, she now has uh, children. She accepted herself the way she is. Um, so I'm not saying you do need to seek help but I, I think uh, you need to embrace who you are um, uh, and uh, nothing is wrong with you. Uh, this is a disease that only um, um, basically attacks the hair follicles. It's not going to cause any additional um, uh, things. And uh, I, I think both are important to accept that uh, for either parents or patients and to seek help. I, I, I do think you need to do what you can but if God forbid it's not happening, so there are things to do. There are wigs, you know, I, I think we need to work on both. Thank you. And I'm gonna take a stab and answer my own question about how we can help by making a shameless plug here, uh, which is number one, to support clinical trials, uh, support scientists like Dr. Gutman, because the way these drugs will become, on, will become accepted in the mainstream is only through clinical trials. So that's one way, if you have a family member or, or you yourself have alopecia, to participate in clinical trials. And even you know, if you, if you don't, and this resonates with you, Financial support to institutions that do this work through you know, philanthropic efforts are also very important in a way to help uh, you know, your affected loved ones. Um, we're going to close with, is there anything I did not ask you, Dr. Gutman, that I should have asked to help you um, really get your message out to patients? Yeah, no, you asked about really everything. One, one thing to say is that um, alopecia areata, like many times patients ask, what are the triggers? And I think you mentioned stress. Stress is a very big factor. We have many times children, for example, somebody died in their family. Um, COVID put a lot of stress on many uh, people. Um, and actually even infections, and that's why COVID plays a role, probably a dual role here. Infections also sometimes stress the body and patients may lose uh, hair. Um, and in terms of the uh, scarring alopecias, uh, a lot is still unknown. Um, um, and we are still learning, but the important thing for both types of alopecias, scarring alopecias uh, that we discussed that are different ones, including in skin of color and alopecia areata. Now, I think the hopeful message to patients is that we now have targets and we have new treatments, which probably a few years ago we didn't have. So you just need to seek help because, um, and real help, I mean, a physician help, uh, and I think you, you may be surprised in a good way.
Uh, on that positive note, uh, I will close thank the government and I want to thank you personally uh, for you reaching out to our patients uh, and uh, really sharing and being so generous with your time. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for having me.